All right. Ready for the word? Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. So, um, yeah, I've been uh, talking about the, the past, what, month or better, actually. It was called uh, Bold as Lions, Bold as a Lion, and uh, basically uh, talking about getting rid of fear, overcoming fear, uh, because God has really been, really started speaking to me a while back about uh, getting, getting his people free from fear. So this is my place of influence, so I want us free from fear. <laughs> and so, you know, we can, we can, we've been going after it, and I think it's been good. It's helped me. I hope it's helped you. Uh, but uh, when we're continuing, so actually this month, what I'm calling it is fearless living, and I want to spend some time and go after some specific kinds of fears. And the idea, of course, is overcoming, amen, uh, because we can, we can live uh, fearlessly. Uh, there's, uh, there's some overcoming to do, but we can do it. I want to start uh, with a, uh, a Bible story. It's Judges chapter 6, verse 1, first of all. Uh, this is a story about a guy named Gideon. Anybody heard of Gideon? So, yeah. And uh, it, uh, it says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them to the hand of Midian for seven years. And uh, then it has nine or ten verses after that that describes that, and I'm not going to read that. But essentially, there was this cycle of things where Israel was in the promised land, right? And sometimes they would be faithful to God and trust in the Lord and call on his name and, you know, and they were walking with God and God was blessing them and enlarging their territory and they were getting victory and dominion and, you know, it was all good. And then there would, they would cycle sometimes and they would turn away from God and build idols and accept the gods of the people around them and, you know, the nations around them and turn away from God. And essentially in this cycle, what would happen is, uh, is God would warn them, but then he would back, basically back off and say, okay, have it your way, you know. And then surrounding nations that were hostile towards Israel would come in, you know, and start to take away their territory and start to oppress them. And that's what was happening here in the nation of Midian uh, was uh, oppressing Israel now because they had turned back to idols and things like that. And uh, let's see, what Midian was doing specifically was destroying their crops. They were invading and then destroying their crops, <laughs> leaving them, you know, hungry and uh, taking some of their land. Anyway, so jump all the way up then to verse uh, uh, 11. And here's, here's where God intervenes. And, and it says just a couple of verses before this that finally, you know, after some years of this oppression, that Israel cried out to God again. And they said, God, help us, right? And God raised up a prophet and, you know, said, uh, all right, I hear you, you know. And so now it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in a place called, I guess that's Oprah, so, right? <laughs> and uh, which belonged to Joash the Abiel's right, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So uh, this, the household is of Joash, but his son Gideon is threshing wheat, but he's doing it in secret, kind of in the wine press, and so that the enemy won't see them and take away the food, the, what little wheat that they managed to, uh, to raise here. And uh, somebody shows up called the angel of the Lord. Who is that? Is that, is that like just an angel? That's actually God. Right? It's actually Jesus. Uh, and if uh, th it's a whole study by itself that we don't have time for, uh, but you know, if you were to trace that in the Old Testament, wherever the, an the angel of the Lord shows up, like a, it's actually a uh, second person of the Trinity who later became the man Jesus. But he's, he speaks as God. He represent him represents himself as God. He comes visibly and tangibly, tangibly and interacts with the people of Israel. And they know that he is God. <laughs> and, 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 and if you read, you know, after this, it, he, Gideon realizes, oh, it was God, right? And I lived. <laughs> uh, so it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, belonged to Joash the Abbas, right? While his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Go ahead. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord, and of course, in the original language, this is Yahweh, Jehovah, Jehovah, how, you know, however you want to pronounce that. And the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> What's Gideon doing? He's hiding in the wine press, threshing some wheat in secret from the enemy because he's afraid, right? And God shows up visibly to him and says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Uh, isn't that, what's funny about that? Oh yeah, he's hiding, right? <laughs> he's, he's hiding. He's, as, why, does, why does God say things like that? Why didn't God show up and say, what are you doing, you chicken? <laughs> no, he says, mighty man of valor. Go ahead, we'll, we'll come back to it. Go ahead. 
13. And Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And now he doesn't realize it's the Lord. He thinks it's an angel, but he doesn't realize it's actually the Lord himself. So uh, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. He's asking a question that he should know the answer to. Why are we in this condition? Because Israel turned away from God again, right? Go ahead. They, in fact, they have a, an idol. His, this family has an idol right in front of their house <laughs> that's not the Lord, right? So, and the Lord turned to him and said, that there's one of the indications too, by the way, that this is actually God speaking to him. The Lord him, turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? <laughs> All right, go ahead. And 15, so Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. And 16, and the, the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. All right. So this is a great conversation. I love this conversation. Go back to 12, please. And what you want to notice is that God is speaking his truth and Gideon is responding with his truth. They both have their truth. You know what that means, right? In American culture now, or at least, you know, it's been that way for a while. Like, there's this real idea that everybody has their own truth, right? I think it's kind of a goofy idea, you know, because there's really only one truth. But everybody has their own perspective. Sure. Okay. So let's put it that way. They're speaking from their own perspective. The Lord is giving his truth, though, and Gideon is giving his his perspective, his truth as he sees it. So the Lord says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. What's God's truth in the matter? Gideon, who's hiding, right, is afraid and intimidated, and God calls him a mighty man of valor. This is God's truth. Because, why is that God's truth? Because God created him to be a mighty man of valor. God put it into him. It's just not awakened yet. It's in there somewhere, right? But it's covered up by chicken right now, right? But it's there. It's there. And God's calling it out. He said, I put that in you. I created you to be a mighty man of valor. I'm calling it out in you. I, God doesn't look at what he sees, right, with the natural there. He looks at what he's put into you, what he's called you to be, and he calls it out. And that's what happens when prophets show up, too, by the way. You have somebody prophesy to you, and they're saying these great things about you, and you're like, that's not me. Yeah. Are, are they just making a mistake, or are they calling out something that God actually put in you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So... The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. That's God's truth. Verse 13. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles, which our father told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Uh, Gideon says, my truth is, I don't know what you're talking about, but my truth is that we are abandoned and forsaken and alone. We are defeated. We are forsaken. We are delivered into the hands of our enemies, and God is not with us. That's my truth. 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? God says, Oh, here's my truth. <laughs> my truth is, mighty man of valor, go in this strength, in this might of yours. You're a great warrior. It's in you. I put it inside of you. Stir it up. Right? Go forth, and you will save Israel from the hand of their enemies because I sent you. God's speaking his truth. They're actually having an argument. It's a polite argument, but it's an argument nonetheless. Is it smart to argue with God? No. Have you ever done it? Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, you may have had an argument similar to this. Whatever God was impressing on you to do, you know, not necessarily defeat the Midianite army, but, you know, whatever God was impressing on you to do, you probably had an argument with him and told him why you couldn't. <laughs> right? It happens pretty often. <laughs> so... Have I not sent you? Go ahead. And 15. So Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. And so Gideon responds with his truth again. Here's my truth. My truth is I'm from the smallest clan and the smallest family. We are nobodies. Okay? We are nobodies. Gideon is essentially saying, I can't do this. And uh, what we're talking about tonight, by the way, is fear of failure. <laughs> overcoming fear of failure. So God is calling Gideon to rise up, 
in this commission from God himself and be a leader and deliver Israel and say, I'm going to be with you and you're going to have victory and you're going to have success. And Gideon's belief, his absolute belief at this point is, I can't do it. I don't know what you're talking about, but I can't do that. I will fail. I'm afraid to do it. I'm afraid to try. And I'm pretty sure that if I try, I'll fail. Please don't make me do this. Please don't make me do this. <laughs> 16. <laughs> and the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. <laughs> Who's going to win this argument, by the way? God, God is going to win this one, yeah. Yeah. You know, he doesn't win everyone, though. Sometimes people just say no. Sometimes people just flat say no. You know. But uh, this one... God's truth gets through and Gideon uh, decides at some point to believe him. Not right away. There's, there's a little more to this story, but this is as far as I'm going right now. But at some point, Gideon decides to believe the Lord. Right? And, and he comes into agreement with him. God said, here's the answer to the thing. It's not about you necessarily. It's about I will be with you again. If I'm with you, you're going to be all right. You'll defeat the enemy. So fear of failure. Uh, have, have you had an argument like this with God? Most of you? Yeah. I have two. I have two. Um, and it's called, uh, in our language today, uh, fear of failure. Uh, John 8, 31 to 36, actually. i give you a Bible promise from Jesus, what Jesus said here. Because fear, uh, as we've been talking about the past year, right? Fear is an enemy. Isn't it? Fear is evil, right? Amen. Fear is evil. Theology 101. God is good. Devil's bad. Which side is fear on? <laughs> devil, bad. Fear is tormenting. Fear is, is uh, limiting. It's bondage. It's, it's, it's uh, affliction. Uh, it's a re result of the fall. It's what street orphans feel. Uh, and God calls us beloved sons. We're not street orphans. He wants to defeat fear in our lives. He wants to get us free from fear. Fear is a major tool of the enemy to limit us and oppress us. It truly, truly is. Right? And it's very effective, by the way. It's super effective, right? That's why I'm spending real time on this. I'm really hoping to tear this up for a bunch of you and get some breakthrough in this, right? So here's what Jesus said uh, to those who, Jews who believed in him, because many did not, but some did. He said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you uh, free. Truth always makes you free. That's one of the qualities of truth. It's liberating, and it's freeing. And any time you get real truth, yeah, it brings, it brings some freedom. Uh, but here, in this case, he says, it's from my word. You'll know it from my word. And then, go ahead, verse 33. They answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants, and we've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? That statement was patently false on the surface of it. The Jews had been in bondage to oh, Assyria and Babylon and uh, Greeks and Romans and now currently Romans, I mean, they, right? And, and also uh, what, what Jesus was really trying to go after is that they were in bondage to sin and they didn't recognize it and they needed to be set free uh, from spiritual slavery. But uh, instead of admitting that, the uh, Pharisees here were actually offended, deeply offended by the idea that they needed to be set free from something. So 34. And Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Are you sure you're free? <laughs> Are you sure you're free? Think about this one. <laughs> Go ahead. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. But who does abide in the house forever? A son. Right? So if you get born again through Jesus Christ, now you're a son or a daughter. And a son or a daughter lives forever in the household of the Father. Amen. Yeah. Go ahead. And 36 says, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That second person of the Trinity who showed up and talked to Gideon, right, called the angel of the Lord, identified himself as the Lord, spoke as God, now became someone called the Son of God, in God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. And he says to them, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. In fact, you'll become sons and daughters also. Join the family. You'll live forever and you'll be free. So he's talking about freedom and the th two things he said for freedom here was Jesus, receive Jesus and come to know his truth. Because you know that when you receive Jesus, you've been set free, but you may not act like you're free. You may not really know you're free. 
right? You've been set free, <laughs> but it's kind of like, you know, if you can train, you can train an animal, right? If you put them in a little, a little enclosure and there's a door there and it, the door's open, but if you just put a little electric shock, a little electric current there, right? And the animal tries to get out two or three times and goes, Zzz, whoa. Zzz, whoa. After they do that about three times, you can turn that off. They're not going through there anymore. They're a captive, <laughs> even though they're not, right? Even though they're not, <laughs> right? And so basically that's the condition when you accept Jesus, you've been set free, that's gone. You're, you're free to go out. You're free to live powerfully, boldly, joyfully, right? But you may not believe it yet. And that's why Jesus also said, then you'll know my word and the truth will make you free. The truth breaks down the lies and then you can walk out of there and go, ha, ah, I can live free. Wow, <laughs> right? This is real. So get born again, accept Jesus, but also learn his word and become increasingly free, knowing you're free and knowing how to live free. Uh, God's, God's vision for us in this thing is, the reason for this is uh, just, I mean, picture yourself living in a place where you're never afraid to talk to people, you're never afraid to reach out and make a friend, right? You just, you're comfortable reaching out to people you don't know and say, hey, my name is Mike, how are you doing? Where are you from? What do you do? Make some friends, right? It's okay. Some people will like you, some won't. You know what? It's all good. No fear of rejection, right? Uh, if you want to you try a different job, you want to pursue a different career, you want to start a business, start a company, no fear, just do it. Just do it. Learn, oh, I don't know how to do it. Just learn how to do it. Find out. Do some research. Go do it, right? You, God, you feel like God's calling you into a ministry of some sort. You're to join a ministry, participate in a ministry, or start something new. No fear. Just do it, right? Huh. I'll learn. I don't know how to do that. I'll learn how. I'll make some mistakes. Yep. It's okay. Right? Can, you, can you picture yourself living without fear, right? Because one of the first things that hits most of us is a fear of failure. What if I fail? I'll fail. I don't know how. I've failed before. Somebody, somebody made me believe I was a failure. Somehow, I don't believe I can do this, and I'll fail. And if I fail, I'll be horribly embarrassed, horribly ashamed, and not only that, but my secret will be out. Everybody will know that I'm really a failure, including me. It'll confirm my worst fear. If I fail, it'll confirm what I feared all along, that I really am a failure. And now everybody else will see it too. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's the stuff that goes through our heads, right? And, and there's this approach avoidance. That's an old psychological term, but it applies very well here. Approach avoidance means there's something that you really want, but you're afraid of it. And, th and they did experiments like that with dogs. Same thing as I was talking about earlier. The dog with the electric shock put a bowl of food there right? and, and hook it up to a little electric shock. Just mild, you know. The dog's hungry and the dog goes to eat out of the bowl and touches the bowl and gets shocked. Zoop. Right? So does the dog want the food? Yes. But does he now fear that bowl? <laughs> right? Yes. And so the dog will do what's called approach. Get close to that bowl and then remember that shock and go, no. But I'm really hungry and I really want that food. And the anxiety level goes up. And he goes, no, I don't think so. You know what I'm talking about? And this is what we do too. Because if you've had a failure in your life, or if somebody convinced you that you were a failure, or somebody treated you like a failure, or said you were stupid and you could never do anything right, or whatever it was, or you just, you really had a failure that really embarrassed you, right? And it's like, zzz, you got zapped, right? And now you want to try something new, and the anxiety level rises up, and you go, no. But I really want to try something new. I want to start a business. I want to make friends. I want to fix this relationship. I want to participate in this ministry. I want to, I want to do this. I want to learn a language. I want to learn an instrument. No, but I'll fail, and it'll be embarrassing and horrible. Anybody? No? Okay. Yeah. This is what God wants to set you free from, to get you living, powerfully living freely. What are, what are some of the roots? I just mentioned them. What are some of the roots why, why sometimes we have that fear of failure? Where does that thing come from? It can come from several things. Maybe when you're growing up, formative years, significant person, parent, or somebody else convinced you that you were stupid, couldn't do anything right, and failure. Or maybe they didn't say it. Maybe they just treated you that way. And you came to believe and internalize somehow, I'm a failure, right? I'm, I'm not smart enough. I just can't do what other people can do or whatever it, whatever it may be, it gets inside of you. Once it gets inside of you, 
It's, you know, it's, it's kind of controlling stuff, isn't it, right? Yeah, or uh, maybe, maybe, maybe somebody didn't say it to you or treat you that way. Maybe you just saw, as you're growing up, you saw failure modeled. Maybe you lived in a family where there was failure after failure. Brokenness, poverty, tragedy, failure after failure. There was never stability, never success, never security, right? Maybe you saw that, and so you just grew up, and that's what you know. It's just all I know. It's what I've seen. When I see my future, that's what I see. That's all I've ever seen. Okay? Maybe that's it. Fear of failure. You can, have this, you can have a career. You can have a successful life. No, I can't. I've never seen it. I don't know what it looks like. Uh, maybe, maybe none of those things. Maybe you didn't grow up with fear of failure. You just tried something and you failed. Maybe you took a risk and you failed and it was embarrassing and horrible and you were ashamed. And that's when you got zapped. Zzz. So every time you want to try something new again, it's like a trauma, you know, that, that kicks in. Uh, is, am I talking to the right people? Does anybody experience fear of failure? Thank you. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I know what that feels like. <laughs> I know that when God called me to do what I'm doing now, you know, it, it's still, I, I argued with God just like Gideon, like, you got the wrong guy. You know, I mean, you got, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. And uh, one of the things, and I had some failures, by the way, too. <laughs> you know, I, I started a church, started ministry, crashed. Started a church again, crashed. Okay. Started a church again, here we are. <laughs> but, yeah, and every time, every time it crashed, I was like, God, I quit, I resign, are you kidding? You called the wrong guy. What were you thinking, Lord? And he's like, try it again. <laughs> what? <laughs> You know what you're asking me? Try it again. <laughs> right? Because, you know, again, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So what if I failed? What if I failed? So what? Learn something from it and get up and go again. <laughs> you know, this, this, part of the, part of the uh, this is like seriously profound. Part of the secret to getting free from fear of failure is saying, so what? Seriously, what if I fail? So what? But it'll be terrible. Only if you really think it's terrible. But I'll be embarrassed. Get over it. I'll be ashamed. Get over it. I can never do it again. Get over it. It'll be terrible. Only if you think it's terrible. Try this. So what? Say that with me. So what? Isn't that feel good? <laughs> yeah. I, I tried this and I failed. So what? Maybe I should try it again. Maybe I learned something, or I could learn a little bit more and then try it again. <laughs> yeah. That's hugely liberating. That's really profound, whether you know it or not. <laughs> It'll come to you when you need it. So what? <laughs> um, how, does it, how does this really affect us? Again, it's the, uh, the way to diagnose this, and most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You raised your hand. When you think of doing something new, right, or I'm going to go meet this person, right? I'm a little bit shy, but I'm going to go meet this person. And you start to do, and the anxiety level rises up. Or I want to witness to somebody. I feel like I want to tell people about Jesus. I mean, that's, I see people do that, and I want to do that. And you, you're going to talk to somebody, and then the anxiety level goes up, and you go away. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. I'm going to learn this language. I'm going to participate in this ministry. I'm going to start this business. Whatever it is. The anxiety level goes up. And whew, yeah. so if, if that's what happens, that's fear of failure. And usually, the real power of this thing, I, I, I said it a few minutes back, but I want to repeat it, because this is another one of those really profound parts of this thing. Usually the power of fear of failure is the belief inside of myself that I am a failure. It's not necessarily the belief that I will fail. It's somewhere inside of me, but the belief that I really am a failure. Personally, by nature, that's, I'm a failure. And so, it's a secret though, <laughs> right? And I, I walk among you, you know, as a normal human being, but you don't know that I'm a failure. But if I try something new, I'll fail, and then everybody will see it, and it'll be terribly embarrassing and I'll be exposed as a failure. And it confirms my worst fear that I am a failure. You know what I'm talking about? That's, that's the power of this particular fear, is it's a secret fear that lives inside of you. And, and you just try to avoid taking risks. If you, if you know that you tend to avoid taking risks, 
And I don't, I, don't, I don't mean like running across the street when there's traffic. You know, I mean <laughs> taking risks in life that have a reward to them. Like if I start this business, I could really succeed, right? This could really be great. Or if I start this ministry, participate in this ministry, it could be really awesome. Or if I just reach out to this person, I might make a great friend, you know? A reward. But instead, if you just avoid taking risks because that thing pops up, what if? I'll be embarrassed, it'll fail, you know, and then I'll be... It's, it's, it always goes back somehow to this secret belief that I'm already a failure, and you just, you don't want to expose that belief. So part of this thing is just really identifying that lie, taking that lie out and looking at it and saying, do I believe that I'm a failure, All right? Or doomed to failure, or whatever it may be, you know? I, I believed that for many, many years. I truly did. I, I, that, was, that was part of me. It was actually, it was, it was a part of me, and I remember actually one time the Holy Spirit leading me what to do, um, and he said, basically, take a piece of paper and write failure, and I did, I wrote failure, and I had a wooden cross in my backyard that we use sometimes for church events, you know, I don't usually have a cross back there, but I, I, I do for some, some events, and so he said, take that piece of paper, and take a hammer and a nail, and go to that cross, and nail that thing up there, and I did, I nailed the word failure to a cross, <laughs> And I said, in the name of Jesus, whatever that was, if that was me, that's the old me that died with Jesus. That's the old me that died on that cross. And whatever, if that was a curse on my life, if that was just something that I believed and internalized, I nailed it to the cross and I left it there and I broke that in the name of Jesus and renounced that. I said, God, uh, what I read in the word is that you bless people and you give people success, right? And you prosper people, right? You are God and that's what I want. I want the blessing, you know? And I just, just did that exchange by faith. You know, and uh, I can absolutely tell you something changed that day. Really, absolutely can tell you something changed uh, because I did it on purpose. I did it understanding, and I and I exchanged at the cross. You know, the old for the new, and that's what the gospel is. That's what the gospel is. So, really, what what do we do with this? If if you have this issue, uh, one of the one of the most important things you can do is identify the lie. And what I mean by that is. Uh, if, if you have a fear of failure in your life to any degree, just to try to identify where it came from. Uh, it's not about blaming anybody. It's not about blaming. It's about clarifying it. Where did this come from? So I could take it out and look at it and break it. Right? So did somebody important in your life, parent or other person, talk to you in a way that made you feel like a failure? And they kept speaking to you that way until it just got inside of you and it did its work, it did its damage, and you believed it. Or did somebody treat you in a way that just made you feel like a failure? Everything you did was wrong. Every mistake you make, they rubbed your nose in it. Okay? If, if somebody treated you in a way that made you internalize failure, fear of failure, and a belief in failure, that's where it came from. It's important to identify it. Maybe, maybe again, it was you took a risk, you tried something, and you fell on your face. <laughs> and you didn't say, so what? You, you internalized it, got all traumatized, and said, oh, I'll never do that again, right? And uh, maybe that was it. Wherever the lie came from, it's important to recognize it. Because, and, and then what is the lie? Maybe somebody said, you're too stupid to do anything. You know, I mean, and you just believed that. I, and I hear that from people all the time. Can you do this? No, I'm too stupid. Really? Where did that come from? Are you pressing a little button in your mind and playing a tape that somebody recorded into your brain? I'm too stupid. I can't do this, right? Where does that come from? Where did that come from, right? What is the lie? What is the lie? Do you believe that you're just destined to fail? Do you believe that if you try something that's, that's risky, but has big reward maybe, that you'll fail and you'll just be embarrassed and humiliated and ashamed? You know, what is the lie? Well, if you take it out and look at it, because it's hidden in darkness, you know, <laughs> kind of in there, and when you take it out in the light and say, oh, here's the lie, Right here, light shines on it, and it starts to go, <laughs> you know, like the witch in the Wizard of Oz, melting, 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 you know. It loses its power when you take it out and look at it and say, oh, that's where it came from, that's what it is. And you, and you break the power on purpose. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of that lie. It will not rule over me, right? It's a lie. Somebody made me believe that I was a failure, or maybe I just grew up in a place where everybody failed. Everybody just, everybody important to me that I had my eyes on as I'm growing up, they all failed, you know? <laughs> and, and I just came to believe that. If that's where the lie came from, identify it, right? Does that mean that that defines me? Does that mean that that is my destiny? No. 
but what, I don't know how to succeed. I didn't grow up with that. I wasn't taught it. I didn't see it modeled. I don't know how to succeed. Okay, is it okay to say so? Yes. Say, I want to learn how. I want to learn how. I can't ask that question. That's too embarrassing. So what? Try that again. So what? <laughs> yeah. Ask the question. I don't know how to do that. So what? Ask somebody. I never learned how to play this instrument. I never learned how to participate in this ministry. I never learned how to talk to people that I don't know. I never learned how to fix a car. I never learned how to whatever. Ask somebody. It'll be embarrassing. So what? Right? <laughs> you can learn. Right? You can learn. You can learn. Fear of failure is tormenting. It's bondage, isn't it? It's limiting. It keeps you from living. And God wants us to live boldly. Eh? Love boldly. Lead boldly. Eh? And get free. So identify the lie. It's a very, very powerful thing. Identify where the lie came from. And then uh, the next thing you do is uh, forgive the person. If there was somebody that caused you to believe that lie, right? If it was a person that talked to you like you were stupid and rubbed your nose in every mistake and made you feel like a failure, then purposely forgive that person for making you believe that you were a failure or that you would be a failure. When you forgive somebody, you acknowledge the power, of, you know, acknowledge the damage that was done, right, and where it came from, and you assign the responsibility not to blame, but so that you can get free. This is where it came from. I forgive you. Yeah. And... And then you break the power of that lie. In the name of Jesus, I'm not going to live with that fear anymore. I break the power of fear. I got dominion from God. His perfect love is growing in me and pushing out fear, and I'm going to live freely and powerfully. Whew, yeah. Mm. One of the things that we also have to do is make the decision that we're worth fighting for. This is super important because if you've been really, uh, if, if, the, if the fear of failure has really gotten a grip on you, what you tend to believe is that you're not worth fighting for, that I'm not worth enough to fight for. Do you know what I'm talking about there? Because yeah. there's, there's this kind of built-in sense of, well, I'm just, I'm just doomed to this. Uh, and so you have to decide, no, my, my future, my happiness, my life, and my success are worth fighting for, right? I'm worth fighting for. I'm going to have to do some fighting, but I'm worth fighting for. Right? I want to live freely and powerfully and happily and have good relationships and try new things and learn new things and succeed at some stuff. Right? And so, you know, you have to decide, I'm worth that. And yeah, and if you, don't, if you identify a mindset that you're not worth fighting for, you've got to break that thing. Because... Uh, all you're doing is coming into agreement with God who says that you are worth saving. Why did Jesus die for you on the cross? Because he decided you were worth it. Right? He decided you were worth it. Everything he paid, you're worth saving. You're worth bringing back to him. And you're worth in him loving you and investing in your future and forgiving your past. You, if, you, if God says you're worth it, you should agree with him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and fight for yourself. Amen. <laughs> Because I tell you, I mean, who is, who is the one that's trying to keep us oppressed and in bondage? It's devil. Devil, right? D-E-B-I-L, devil. <laughs> I'm kidding. Devil, seriously. <laughs> I mean, that's where that comes from, right? It's evil. He wants to hurt us. He wants to oppress us. He wants to keep us down. Do spiritual warfare. Decide you're worth fighting for. Amen? Yeah. Take what Jesus gave you and, and uh, walk into freedom. Uh, we have to replace the lie with the truth. If I, if I came to believe that I was a failure and I was doomed to failure, and then I have to decide to believe what God says. What did God say to, to uh, Gideon? I will be with you. You're going to win, right? <laughs> You're going to win. Right? And God says the same thing to all of us. You don't have to overcome the Midianites. You know, you just have to live your life with Jesus, with faith right? and confidence and walk walk into the life that he has for you, right? And so you replace the lie with truth, which is God's going to be with me. And even if I don't know how to do something, I can learn. I can learn. 
But it'll be so embarrassing to ask. No, it won't. What's the answer to that? So what? Thank you. <laughs> ask somebody. I want to learn how to do this. I want to learn. Will you, will you help me? Will you teach me? Sure. Absolutely. You know what? When, and just, uh, we have to get, get over the idea that failing is uh, a huge tragedy. Because uh, any successful person will tell you that on the path to whatever success they're walking in now was many failures, failures and mistakes. Any successful person will tell you that. There's always mistakes and failures. They, uh, instead of getting traumatized and defeated and staying there, they s brush themselves off at some point and say, wow, whew, that hurt. Okay, what did I do wrong? What can I do right? <laughs> you know, let's keep going, right? It is. And, uh, you know, and if somebody makes fun of you for failing, if somebody judges you, criticizes you, or makes fun of you, or puts you down for failing, your answer is, so what? so what? If you don't love me and want the best for me, your opinion doesn't count. <laughs> and I don't say that arrogantly. I mean, that's the attitude to have, right? I love you, right? But if you're a person who's going to put me down and criticize me, you know, right, when I'm, and pull me back down when I'm trying to get up, if that's what you are, your opinion doesn't count, right? If you're someone who loves me and you want the best for me, I want to hear what you have to say, Amen. right? <laughs> Absolutely, right? That's just healthy, right? So, uh, another thing to, to learn about here is that, uh, Partial successes are still successes. If you try something, well, I want to make 10 new friends. I've, like, I've been really afraid to reach out to people and I feel very alone, but I want to, I want to reach out to 10 new friends and the next 10 new people in the next month, right? And you try it and you actually end up with two friends. Did you meet your goal? Nope. Was it still a success? Yep, it's two more than you had. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> In fact, let's take that a little bit farther. What if it doesn't work at all the first month, your social skills are terrible, and you reached out to 10 people and it just didn't work, but you tried? Is trying a success? Yep. It is. If you had a fear of failure, and that cost trying really cost you something, and you just tried, you succeeded. Try again, <laughs> right? Just try again. And if you want 10 new friends and you end up with two, that's two more than you had. And it's a success. Celebrate every success. Amen. I mean, seriously, right? And if somebody tells you what you did wrong, you know, so what? <laughs> yeah. I'm worth fighting for. I'm going to celebrate every step forward. God is for you, not against you. Amen? Amen. You've got to believe that. God is for you. No failure defines you. It's another truth we just have to, have to internalize. If I do fail at something, if I make a mistake, it does not define me. It is not my destiny. It is not my, my identity. It's a learning experience. I know this might sound like a self-help talk, but I can guarantee you that if you just approach it as self-help, uh, it, it doesn't tend to take you very far, and most people it doesn't work for. But if, but if God's in the mix, amen, God's power, God's presence, God's love, and God's truth gets a hold of you, mm hmm, yeah, <laughs> right? Fear is no match. Perfect love pushes out fear, casts out fear. And, uh, and, and uh, whatever, you, whatever you are learning to do and trying to do, somebody will always be better than you, right? Is that a problem? No, no. So what? Somebody's always better than you at this. So I'm just going to keep learning and going forward, right? <laughs> uh, what I'm, uh, we're going to pray here in a moment. I, just, I, I believe that the Word of God this is what God showed me months ago right? in, a, in a very cool way, that the Word of God just goes into you and it transforms you on the inside. Right? And that's what this Word is doing. The sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Right? You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And just like Gideon, God says to you, I'm, I'm calling you to do something that you're afraid of and you feel it's too big for you. And just say yes. <laughs> just say yes. <laughs> I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be defeating the Midianite army. Whatever is a step forward for you, God's with you. Right? And it'll be, it'll be good. Uh, Want to pray? Uh, let's pray. If we can stand together and uh, I want to, uh, if you're new with us, 
Uh, what we do is we take the next few minutes. We're not, we're not done. We take the next several minutes and we invite the Holy Spirit to come and pour this word into you that, it'll, that the word will become faith in your heart, that the word will become reality in your soul. It'll become part of you and it'll transform you and it'll empower you. Right now, Jesus, Son of God, is our Savior and He sets us free. He sets us free from fear, fear of failure, fear of rejection, from insecurity and anxiety. Jesus sets us free. But it's the truth. It's the truth that makes us understand that freedom and walk in that freedom. Holy Spirit, come now for every person in this room. Holy Spirit, come and just pour into their heart right now the revelation of truth that they have been set free and that they have nothing to fear by living boldly, living with childlike adventure. learning new things, trying new things, reaching out to people. Nothing to lose, everything to gain. No longer imprisoned by fear. I declare freedom over every person hearing my voice right now. I declare freedom over us. Freedom from fear of failure. Freedom to live like children in adventure with anticipation, not fear, with excitement with a sense of curiosity and joy, ready to learn, not caring if I make a mistake, if I fall down, I just get back up like a little kid and go for it again. I declare freedom for every person in this house, in this family, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, pour into each of us. He said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty pour into us the revelation of victory and liberty and eternal life. We live with a safety net that is the love of God, the protection of God. We live with a safety net. We can never ever really fail. We can never permanently fail. God, you make all things new said that over, you said it in Isaiah, you said it in Revelation, you said it over and over, God, you make all things new. Breathe into everybody here, God. Newness of faith, adventure, boldness, freedom from fear. So right now, think, think about for a moment, if, if you can recognize, just for this moment, where if, if, if fear of failure was part of your life, and probably most of you had some of it, not everybody, but probably most of you had some of this. If you recognize fear of failure had power in your life, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Was it just what you saw modeled? Did somebody make you feel like a failure? Did you try something and really fall on your face? What is the lie? Do you believe that you're too stupid? Do you believe that you're just doomed to failure? Do you believe that success is for other people, not you? Do you believe you just can't learn, that you can never learn it? And do you believe that embarrassment is the worst possible thing that could happen to you? If, if there's a person involved that made you feel like a failure, made you believe that you were a failure, right now just whisper, in the name of Jesus, I forgive you. I forgive you for making me believe that I would be a failure. For making me believe, whatever it is, I'm too stupid, I, I couldn't do it. Just, it's important to be as specific as you can. I forgive you for making me believe that.
And now, just say this with me out loud. In the name of Jesus, fear of failure, all the spirit and power behind that fear. In the name of Jesus, you're a lie, you're defeated. I command you get out of my life. I break your power in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come into me. Give me childlike adventure boldness, curiosity, a spirit of fun, living fearlessly, learning new things, meeting new people, and doing stuff. <laughs> and even if I fall down, I'll say, so what? <laughs> Get back up and live fearlessly. Holy Spirit, yeah, bring that into my heart. In Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. Actually had the thought recently that if if there was something I wanted to try, and even if I absolutely knew that I would fail. I mean, seriously, if I really actually knew that I would fail in advance, should I still try it? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> it's still, the value is in trying it. The value is in stepping out. <laughs> so God, I declare over this family, this house, in Jesus' name, that childlike spirit of adventure, boldness, and freedom in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. <laughs> ah, <that was> good. <laughs>